Thanks. I appreciate you dedicated people staying uh, till the very end. Uh, I'm going to spend 20 minutes to give you some practical, hands-on UX tips that you can put into practice on your projects right away. Um, I am the uh, design director of Simply Secure. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. I tweeted out a copy of these slides. They're available if, if you find them helpful. Um, so Simply Secure is a US-based nonprofit. I'm currently located here in Berlin. And um, we focus on questions of security, privacy, transparency, and ethics. Our historic core has been around supporting um, open source secure communications projects, but uh, we've expanded our focus into some other kind of more emerging um, areas, like specifically um, domain areas around things like IoT and machine learning. But developers are one of our core audiences. And a lot of our work, and my work in particular, is professional education to get software developers going with uh, some of the basics of UX so that they can get um, their products and services and technology accessible to you and usable to a broader group of people. So there, there are two kind of things, topics I'm going to talk through. The first is basically what UX is and that UX is more than colors. There's a misconception that it's just kind of icons or font choices, and I'm trying to you know, show a little more context around that. And the second is on the user research side, which is around asking why and not what. So definition, user experience design, or UX, is creating digital experiences that meet people's needs. And I think one of the, the graphics that I find pretty evocative for communicating what UX is are just this set of screenshots, because these are all clear and understandable at, at this scale. You don't really need to know the details of what's going on here to be able to make some judgments about the flow between the screens. So um, I'm going to share kind of two e e examples here, and this is the the counter e example, um, to prove the point that user experience is more than icons and, and colors. This is um, some screenshots from a few years ago of lock icons of the Chinese mobile internet. So I um, don't speak or read Chinese, so many of these um, you know, products are kind of beyond me. This is an image shared from um, Dan Grover, who, who'd worked there, and I, I think that from someone that comes from an organization that really works on um, supporting secure communication tools and things like end-to-end -end encryption, a lot of these lock icons don't really convey much meaning because it gets into questions like, what's your threat model? And um, as a designer, I can make a lock that has two states, and one state is open, and on click, it goes to closed. If you'd like, it can even make a little sound. And, uh, and that's not hooked up to anything. That is completely a cosmetic change. So instead of these kinds of only superficial color and, and font and logo choices, I want to um, get into some of the, the kind of deeper um, examples of, of behavior and how to communicate behavior to users. So the reason that I feel that this is a critically important topic um, is that I believe in the mission of many open source projects, but I am concerned that some of that good work is limited in impact because people often don't understand what's going on. So the user experience design shape the understanding, people's understanding and influence behavior, but if the interface doesn't make it clear that uh, how something works, people can, aren't going to use it. So um, I think that developer-first software can often be, be very kind of elegant from a behind-the-screen code point of view and may have a lot of features, but a lot of the, the kind of nuance and, and elegance of, of, of what those features can do is lost um, in that last kind of bit to uh, communicate to end users how stuff is supposed to work. 
so this is an example that I consider kind of the opposite of the, the block badge icons that aren't that meaningful. So this is from, uh, these are screenshots from messaging apps. Uh, they're taken from an iPhone. And just at this, this scale, I can see that um, as an iPhone user, I get green uh, speech bubbles or blue speech bubbles in the um, iOS native messaging client, depending on if my messaging partner is also using an iPhone. So that's just some information for me about kind of what's going on with the other person. But then red receipts, I think, are an example of how UX clarifies some complex functionality in a very, very simple way. So in um, the iOS messaging client, you get words, a couple of characters, read and a time, or delivered. WhatsApp, uh, the messaging platform, has a convention that some groups opt to use check marks to issue red receipts. And that check mark is an example of a UX decision that I think is pretty effective. It works all around the world. I don't need to know if my messaging partner is on Android or iOS. I don't need to know if they're on Wi-Fi or the cellular network. I don't need to know if they're telecom or AT&T or Orange or any of these global pr service providers. It just works. But the thing that makes this interesting to me from a UX point of view is that it changes behavior. So um, an example of a functional description would be a, a, a different messaging app may say, we issue red receipts. But if the way that you get to a red receipt is you long press on the user's name, the, the sender's name, and then get to the message menu, and then you type in message ID you know, equals 053 because it's your 53rd exchange, and it returns status as 0 or status as 1, um, that is meeting the, maybe the functional requirements of uh, issuing a red receipt, but it's not going to change behavior in the same way. So paying attention to the presentation of information. Another example, information architecture, what you put on menus. This is a very important way to help people navigate what is going on with um, with your product, how to make it discoverable to other people. So one kind of quick way to get started is to look at the menu structure and put them on Post-its and look at it. And a common thing that happens, particularly in open source projects with distributed con contributors, is your team structure shows up in the menus. And in some cases, that's totally fine. And in other cases, that might not be quite so helpful. So um, in one example, I'm not going to you know, kind of name the team that worked on this, because I, I don't want to point them out for the purpose of shaming them. But it was just interesting that when, when I looked at this tool that was targeting um, people that wanted to shoot live video um, as a kind of a news source, they had two different kinds of parallel structures. One was templates, and the other was something like examples. And the templates team was different than the examples team. And that was sort of why they had this kind of parallel structure. But as a user, that, that's not really helpful to me. There was so much overlap between those kinds of things that I, I didn't really get how they were different. Um, so one kind of really clear pragmatic thing that, that you can work on um, with a, a team is a style guide. This might be something that you use to codify what you already are doing, the choices you've already made, or it could be something that you would want to hire a designer to produce for you. And um, you know, I think that the Tor project has recently put out their style guide. Um, Ura Design worked on that. Simply Secure had a, played a part in it as well. And I think that that's actually a pretty nice e example of, of showing how a style guide isn't some kind of like top-down police decision making about how everything must conform. It's actually a tool to encourage more to contributors and more distributed contributions over time. Because you have a little bit of the rules of the road, you have agreement on exactly what the, the hex color um, for your different fonts is going to be. And that can be a way to um, help people do something consistent. 
So in the physical space at the top, colors are a bit washed out, but um, at the top you see what is intended to be a Starbucks cup. With, um, they have an iconic green color that they've taken the care and attention to get that color all around the world. Different inks, different papers, different continents. They really made it clear that that, that kind of color stands for something and it's what they are. So, I guess the one side summary of this so far, UX is more than colors and icons. It's these details that shape understanding and influence behavior. So um, the next kind of chunk of this is around user research and asking why and not what. So and, um, it's never too early to get user feedback, even if you're at the idea stage. Different methods work for different phases of the process. So that's kind of thing one to keep in mind. And the, the second thing is, um, if you do user, user research and sit down with someone, they aren't going to tell you as, um, as a developer like what to do. They're not going to give you advice. They're going to talk about their own problems and tell you what they are trying to do. I recommend in-person observations with people using stuff wherever possible. This is me in the field kind of learning about um, you know, how messaging works and people who are power messengers. And um, when you get the opportunity to actually sit side by side with people and look over their shoulder, it can be an extremely effective, extremely eye-opening um, way to, to get feedback. But even if you aren't going to go talk to people outside your organization, my quick start tip number one is take what you have and print it. It's not that I don't like trees. It's that something kind of magical happens when you print things and pin them up on the wall. Similar to, um, you know, over the, the course of, of you know, my speaking career, I can proofread something so many times, a presentation, but somehow, once it's up on the screen behind me really large, it's much easier to find the typo all of a sudden. It's just kind of the, the way that, that things, things work sometimes. And when you print something out, you're able to decontextualize it a little bit, make it a little bit unfamiliar, and it'll give you a sense of fresh eyes that it may help you already start to answer some of your own questions. Like, wow, there's really a lot of stuff going on under this one menu, and like, why are we calling this this, and how do these screens relate? And that's a UX activity that you can do with only a screen capture tool and a printer and start to look at, look at the structure and see what you see. A second quick start tip is if you're unsure, you're stuck, you're not clear on how to move forward with the feature, what are good ways to do things? Take an example that's out there now, particularly a popular example. So I don't support the values of every kind of mass mainstream software product that's out there, but I can say that in general, things with very large user bases are usable. So if millions of people are able to use something, you can look at them as an example for how to present things in a way that a wide group of people, a global audience, can navigate. This is a, um, a screenshot from Jitsi, which is a you know, video conferencing software. And this was part of an exercise to kind of give, get some comments around how to communicate um, values to, to end users. How do you explain the benefits of, of your, uh, your product? Um, and then finally, I would like to encourage you all to think not only about the product that you're building, but also the companion pieces that support how you talk about it. And this is pretty controversial um, to show at a, at a venue um, you know, like this that's so committed to, to open source, but I thought I would take the risk because it's, it's late and hopefully everyone is a bit relaxed. So. Um, this is an example from a, a website where I mean, we'd ask people to highlight parts of it that they found confusing. And one of the things that came through very consistently, this was in the context of people who used uh, file sharing services and cloud-based storage. And in this case, there was a really big emphasis and a really big kind of open source love pride and leading with open source as a differentiator for why to use their product and not any of the competitors. And the audience, in, in this case, really didn't understand that. So I think that as a community, there is a lot of, of work to do on how to communicate 
what makes open soft source software special to a mass audience. And in this case, this claim, um, you know, open source software, anyone can read the code and confirm that it doesn't have secret backdoors. Makes a ton of sense. This person actually understood that to mean something more like, um, I'm expected to check the own code, my, the code myself, even though I don't have the skills to do that. And the sense was that open source was too much like crowdsourced, and that it was just going to be like the whole community, the people that didn't really know what they were doing, were going to somehow contribute and build something. So that that actually you know isn't really consistent with the message that they wanted to con convey. Um, so I'd like to you know give some some. Positive praise to uh, Least Authority, uh, an open source uh, distributed file system. And you know, they have done a, you know, a bunch of, kind of work on the UX side, particularly you know, in their GridSync product around kind of security education. And a lot of the way that they've done this is through this paper prototyping method and having an end user sit down and walk through a stack of pages, printed out screenshots while they think aloud. Yes, of course, it's real software, but sometimes it's nice to do it on paper. When you do it on paper, you can pull things side by side. It can be a much easier way to kind of talk about what the flow is. And many people who've been to school are quite comfortable if you give them a piece of paper and a pen to make some notes and, and some circles. And things that are on the screen can feel so formal and finished, um, especially to people that don't write code themselves. It can be a nice way to get some, um, some feedback. So this is a um, extremely quick and basic way to make um, uh, like wireframes. So these are screenshots from the Twitter app on the mobile phone. And in this case, I'm actually holding a, a printout of the screenshots in a window that's backlit with a piece of plain white paper over it. And that makes it very easy and possible to, to trace over them so that you can start to see these kinds of things. So the, the, the magic that just happened here is these are printouts that I traced in the window, and the result is uh, something like this, where I can now start to call out at the right level of abstractions, what are the menus named? What are the different things that you can click on? How is this structured? And this is the way that most UX designers learn how to do projects. Designers that don't work on a dedicated product team all the time, they're going to find something similar and print it out and do this kind of exercise in order to kind of get clear on what the structure is. And uh, this slide was a bit out of order, but I'd also like to give um, some recognition to the Tails team. Um, on the Simply Secure blog, my uh, colleague Eileen Wagner recently wrote up an interview uh, with their team that talks about some of the work that they've done on their UX UI sprints. Um, it's an open source operating system for people with high security needs. And they kind of give some um, developer kind of perspectives on that. So those are the two kind of chunks of this, this talk. UX is more than colors. Ask why, not what. And to conclude, I'm just going to reiterate, user experience design deal details shape the experience. And if an interface has technical features and the UX is confusing, people won't use them. It's actually even potentially more dangerous than that, because open source contributors may enjoy um, the ability, knowing they have the ability and the power to check the code. But most people are making judgments on the quality of the engineering based on the quality of the UX, by most people meaning a kind of mass audience. So by way of conclusion, I would like to say that um, simplysecure.org, we have a knowledge base with a bunch of different topics. Um, there are blog articles on a kind of a range of things in the UX plus security space, including more about how to get going in UX and in, in user research. As an educational um, NGO, we work for you, so we welcome your feedback on what to prioritize. If there's an article or a resource or a topic you were hoping would be addressed and it wasn't, please uh, let us know. And with that, I will say thank you. Um, these are different ways to reach out to us if you're interested in joining our public Slack channel. Uh, these are our Twitter handles and my real email address. So thank you very much.
questions? Remarks? I have one remark. I'm, I'm really happy um, sure. that you are here and that UX design has some place um, uh, on this conference because um, um, everybody remembers remember the, the early times of open software where it was really a pain in the neck to use it because you couldn't figure out what mm -hmm. button means what and how the different things works. So as me, as a software engineer and as a user, I'm really proud and uh, thank you very much for well, getting you. involved. And I forgot to say, open source design, a super cool group. We've got different representatives here. We're going to have a little meetup during the uh, social event that's happening immediately after this. So we will be near the food with some kind of uh, sign. I believe you can look for me. Um, you know, open source design is, is a group of kind of designers who want to support better design work in open source projects. It's a place that people can post requests um, of, of work that they would like, contributions that they'd like from the community as well. Would the design have a, have a license? Also like I mean, <laughs> I, I think that people who are committed to open source want better design out there, and there are many resources and more kind of coming up that are available for people to use and reuse and adapt. But I, I, there aren't like, I mean, I'm not an expert on all of the different nuances of, of, of that, but in the UX world, in the front end development world generally, there's a ton of like toolkits and, and best practices and, and things that you know, different organizations are, are making them and they're really hoping that they're going to be replicated and customized and you know, forked, I guess, would be the, the analogy. Hi, thank Hi. you for this uh, wonderful session, and I really enjoyed it. Um, my question to you is, I'm not a, a UX designer mm -hmm. or a web developer. How can I take this into the APIs that I design? How can I take your experience, wonderful experience, making sure that the user has a good experience using the product? Mm -hmm. uh, how can we take that to the APIs that we design? I mean, the UX of API design is, is like a real leading edge topic. And I'm, I'm starting to see more attention given to it, especially people that are worried about things like machine learning and automated databases. And, and how do you help the people that are using these tools make more ethical decisions? So right now, there's a lot of interest, but there are very few kind of successes to, to point to. I would say that you know, if your kind of responsibility is creating APIs, then your end users are software developers. Right. And that it's possible to do user research with software developers. Um, Zasha Fall and um, Yezimin Esar here in um, Germany have done some really interesting uh, studies, qualitative, quantitative, of how developers get information. And it's everything from like, finding out that security errors are being replicated from um, insecure code in Stack Overflow, because Stack Overflow is a place that a lot of different developers go to get examples, and there's a mistake there. It gets replicated you know, throughout the ecosystem. So I would say the same kinds of things around um, you know, figuring out what kinds of, of uh, you know, what would go on the sticky notes of the equivalent of menus and trying to make that graphic and, and visual and uh, supporting people that are working in kind of the enterprise UX side. Okay, thank you. Amy, thank you very much for your interesting talk.